But I want to uh, introduce my friend, colleague, uh, Tim Shriver. <laughs> Tim does well. Anything else? Uh, I was going to say more, oh, but, yeah. I, uh, no. <laughs> but, that, but that's fine, Tim. Uh, Tim. Tim's a very special person. Uh, Tim, when I was doing my work, um, someone came to me, uh, Tim came to me, yeah. <laughs> and said he wanted to be a part of it, and he wanted to do a fellowship, and we didn't have fellowships, and Tim invented the fellowship. Yeah, that that's he, right. <laughs> that's true. And, and, and I didn't think that, I wasn't sure that Tim would uh, make it in the tough inner city schools, and Tim was the connector, and Tim made it immediately, and they loved him, and so much so that, that uh, after a couple years, I think it was two years, uh, John Dow, who was then the superintendent, took Tim away and, and, and brought him downtown, and that was the beginning of the movement of, eff of an effort to change um, across the board a focus uh, and move towards a focus on child development. But Tim's a very special person and a very committed person. His work with the Special Olympics tells you that. But he also likes ice cream and he makes movies. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Tim. Doc. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I have 45 minutes? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Comer. Uh, I am super honored and humbled to be in this role, uh, especially after Dr. Comer just gave the keynote address. Uh, uh, it's an, it's, as usual, it's a little bit of back and forth between uh, the good doctor and myself. I always feel like I'm a little bit slow to catch on that I'd have this role, but there's so many people in this room who could have this role. Uh, obviously, we've heard from the mayor, but uh, Marion Wright Edelman here, the uh, legend of the child. Uh, yeah. I know. We can make a swap. You want to come on up here and do it? <laughs> I'm sure people would rather hear from you. Uh, but uh, Linda Mays, the director of the Yale Child Study Center, the great, uh, and Jim Lechman is here, and Bob King is here. Many of, the, many of Dr. Comer's uh, faculty friends are here. Uh, of course, the dean was here earlier. Any one of them could have done so. There's a number of people in the Comer world and universe in here, uh, principals that I worked for. I worked for at least two or three here, Dee Wells, Verdell Roberts, Bridget Hardy, my colleague. Any of these people could come up. Uh, even Justice Norcott, the uh, retired Supreme Court Justice who is here with his great teacher wife, Althea. Even Nick could give this talk, probably. Uh, one of my many old, old bosses here, Norris Haynes, uh, could also, I'm sure, give this talk. But for whatever reason, I was chosen. I think it's because all of them know that Comer's going to be grading at the end of the night, and he's a, he's a very tough grader, uh, uh, and a good one, a fair one, but a tough one. I will, uh, I'll, I'll be uh, as brief as I can be to try to summarize 35 years of my own experience. Uh, and the influence of one man uh, who has been with me uh, since the first time we met, even though we haven't been together uh, every single day. Uh, there has really almost never been a day go by uh, since I wrote to the Yale Child Study Center and said, I want to come over. And he said, we don't have any role for you. And I said, I still want to come over. And he said, well, we don't have a, a, we can't have you. And I said, but I still want to. Anyway, finally I broke through. Um, <laughs> But I want to start with this image um, because I think um, as much as we think child development and as much as we think about families and communities and social systems, uh, this is such an important time in the, in the, in the history of the country. Uh, and at some level, uh, I think we all need to remove our lens just a little bit, just take a little bit of a step back. You know, when the, we're about to have the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, uh, which is next summer. And the astronauts thought when they took the picture of the Earth with the horizon of the moon in it, uh, they thought when this picture came back to Earth that it would change humanity forever. It would, because we would see the fragility, the unity, the wholeness, the beauty of the planet from another, if you will, 
uh, sphere, and that somehow we would see that we're all in it together. Uh, somehow we would see the geography and race and culture and history and all these dividers, religion and so on and so forth, that, that if we looked at it from this level, uh, we would see, as Jim just said, that it, all children are wonderful, beautiful, beyond measure. Um, and we know that this is not the dialogue we're in today, but I, I think if we're going to comorize uh, New Haven, if we're going to comorize schools, why not the world? Uh, and my, my, yeah, why not the world? There is no excuse for not thinking big right now, because, you know, if, we, if we're incrementalists, we're in the wrong business. Um, so um, I, I think uh, let's, 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 let's take stock. Uh, Jim, you said you were in the school, and you saw the fruits of your work, that teachers, educators, children uh, were being exposed to positive developmental experiences, that after 50 years, uh, things have caught on. So my premise is that there are two narratives going on in the country today. Uh, narrative one we all know. Uh, it causes enormous pain and anxiety, Reverend Streets, we were talking about earlier, uh, the, the difficulty, the pain, the trauma that's being surfaced and added to. And then there's another story, and it's the story that Jim Comer is at the center of. It's a story of communities and educators and families beginning to have their eyes and their hearts opened uh, to the possibility of development, to the possibility of health, to the possibility of healing in the culture. Uh, our challenge tonight, I would submit, and tomorrow, obviously, with Professor Darling Hammond, who also should have given this speech tonight, um, is to think about how we make the second narrative the narrative that sticks. Uh, it's out there, in my opinion, at least. It's out there. Uh, but we've got to make it. We've got to make it stick. So uh, I have a little ex experience in this whole issue of um, uh, how we perceive one another. I, I, was, uh, I, I wrote a book a couple years ago which has a chapter on Jim in it. So if you are a devotee of his, you should buy it. No, just kidding. I'm not promoting myself. But I, I, I go to a hotel down south to do a little book event. I get in, in the elevator. There's a guy in the elevator with a 10-gallon hat and cowboy boots. and. Uh, blue jeans and a big silver belt buckle, and I'm just going up to the mezzanine, just like in this hotel, and uh, he looks over at me as I push the mezzanine button. He says, anybody ever tell you uh, you look like a Kennedy? <laughs> <laughs> and I was distracted and preparing for a speech. Uh, so I said, you know, the door opened. I said, yeah, I've heard that before. And as I walk out, he said, well, that must really piss you off, huh? <laughs> So you all think you're the only ones who get judged by, you know, the externals? I know a little bit. No, I'm only kidding. I shouldn't go there. I know I'm going to make a mistake tonight. I'm going to try not to. Um, but there's a serious, there's a serious side uh, to that story. Um, we do judge books by their covers as human beings, often. Uh, we look across the table, we look across the room, we look across our places of business and we make snap judgments. We, we're forced to. Developmentally, we adapt by making judgments, by what we see. Um, and yet so often we get each other wrong. Uh, I have chosen as my topic tonight uh, Jim's book, which I think is actually, it's, it's, it's not my favorite, but I think it's the most important for, for this time. I don't know how many of you have read Beyond Black and White. Uh, this was written before the school's work really started in earnest, if I'm not mistaken, uh, or maybe at the same time as it was emerging. But this is not a book uh, about schools, and it's largely not a book about children, although there's good developmental training in here. It's a book about the country. It's a book about the history of race in this country. It's a book about the tension and the economic pressures that have been put on various subgroups within uh, our, our country's history. It's a book about racism, as the, de the best definition I heard of that it was just last week was uh, structured lovelessness. Structured lovelessness. It's a book about 
the country today. Right here. I have a, I don't know if this thing works. Uh, here's here's a, a selection from the introduction written by the great Robert Coles, uh, uh, who was at Harvard at the time, uh, even Harvard folks like Jim Comer. Um, he writes, uh, Dr. Comer lets us know how sad it is for all of us when a child, any child, loses his faith, or her, his or her, any child loses faith in his or her capacity to trust and enjoy other human beings. We can thank Dr. Comer, uh, and here in, this is in 1970 already, the Academy is beginning to say, thank our, express our thanks for the presence among us of a man like Dr. James P. Comer. But, and this is where Coles, I think, got it right. He didn't write this book uh, for accolades, but for, for another reason. In response, he wrote it to the doctor's sense of alarm and chagrin at the, night, at the sight, my typo, of needless and hence utterly outrageous human suffering. Utterly outrageous human suffering. Uh, this book um, is an invitation uh, to get serious, to get urgent, to get focused, uh, to be accurate, to see with your eyes clearly wide open what's going on in the country today uh, and what we can do about it. It's, I believe, I, I think it's fair to say, Jim, your most politically oriented book. Um, and one that I think is super important. Now, it, amongst the other things in this book, he has a clinical definition of jive cats. <laughs> you want me to read it to you? No. <laughs> we don't have time if I do all the, all the things I want to tell you about what's in this book. But there's a clinical definition of jive cats. There's a clinical definition of magical thinking. There's a clinical definition of three types of whites you want to avoid. <laughs> now, he wrote this before he met me, so <laughs> I cannot be the subject of the three types of whites. The rescuer, the masochist, and the pseudo-ally. Don't raise your hand if you're one of those, because it's not. <laughs> um, oh, there's one at that table over there. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe there's a jive cat. <laughs> I wondered how, you know, you didn't do research on jive cats, so you must have had a little jive cat in you at one point. That's all I can think of on that one. Um, but it has a powerful invitation. Uh, he even, I, I, there is one thing I'm going to read. So he says, uh, when he's talking about people who have bad developmental experiences, uh, uh, they have, uh, the, their drives are unchanneled, uh, they, do, they don't have curiosity, they don't have intellectual pursuits, they're manifest in excessive anger and hostility, uh, they go into survival energy, and then he says, indeed, some white youngsters with these undesirable characteristics, those of a bully, a manipulator, an exploiter, eventually do well in politics. <laughs> <laughs> and business, <laughs> where such traits are an asset. <laughs> That's why I didn't go into politics. Um, he writes beautifully, if you haven't had a primer in child development uh, in the last decade or two, in, in the space of about uh, four or five pages, he writes of all the relational needs of children from zero to one, from two to three, from three to six, the need for trust, the need for security, the need for boundaries, the need for reinforcement, the need for predictable patterns, the need for love, the need for compassion, the need for values. Um, I like to think of this as a summary almost of uh, what I like to call the three Bs, uh, believing in yourself and in others, belonging, connecting in relationships, and becoming. Uh, it's easy for me to remember when I go with the three B's, but um, it's, uh, it's a reminder, as the title suggests, that the problems in the country 
as divisive and infuriating as they can be, uh, regardless of what group or what faction we want to re represent that has been marginalized in the current times, uh, they do go beyond black and white. Uh, because they're American problems, Jim writes about. He writes about the pernicious, uh, persistent quality in this country that despite all of its strengths, continually creates structures that marginalize children and make it difficult for families to grow up whole and healthy. And he points out amongst the many insights I learned from him years ago that the problems you see in communities that have been marginalized excessively by racism or discrimination are the same problems that exist in the rest of the culture. It's just a matter of time. And aren't we seeing that today with so many of the problems that maybe many of us saw 20 or 30 years ago in communities that were uh, had so much injustice in them, are now manifesting uh, across the country. I'll tell you just one quick story after I uh, spent my year with Jim. Um, uh, this was the only lesson he ever really taught me. How, how many of you have had this lesson in his office? Maybe, maybe I was so far behind I'm the only one who got it. <laughs> But I came in knowing a lot about education. I knew my Dewey, I knew my Vygotsky, I knew my Montessori. And the first day of my fellowship at the ripe old age of 24, when I thought I knew most everything I needed to know, he says, tell me the difference between those two shapes uh, in the eyes of a child. And I went through all my various theories. And some of you have seen this, because I use this presentation no matter where I uh, go, because I think it's so central. He says, well, the difference is that the shape on the left, there's a significant adult that wants the child to know its meaning. Uh, the, the shapes have no uh, inherent value. Etta was in the office next door when this lesson was going on, uh, <laughs> keeping things straight. The, the shapes have no inherent value. It is only the relationship that creates the value. Nothing else. Uh, and in that one insight, uh, I believe we now have the recipe for what the rest of the country is catching up to, which is that teaching and learning is not supported by relationships, it's not helped by relationships. It is a relationship. It is a relationship. And it has to be a constructive act by two or more people. Otherwise, you don't have learning. Now, I have about 10 slides of research in here, which I'm not going to use. Uh, but I think we can start today and stop today uh, with so many of Jim's big insights. But to me, this one is so, uh, so powerfully simple that people ignore it, and so powerfully challenging that people are overwhelmed by it. Or they go, yeah, 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 I know that already. But they don't. Or they go, yeah, 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 I know that, but what can I do? That's too big. That's too complicated. But if we don't pay attention, as Jim said just a minute ago, uh, uh, to these issues, to the relationship issues, uh, we guarantee that children will not learn. This thing doesn't work too well. Boom. Keep going. Boom. OK. So uh, I take uh, what Jim teaches me, and I go to Hill House the following year. And I find some tools to create the social plan. Yeah, how many of you have created the, the school plan? So there's the academic component. So I get the social plan. And I have some students who are causing me social trouble. They're right over here, by the way. Medria, Marlene, Teresa. Bad, bad kid. No, they're the best. They're the best students. They're the best students a teacher could ever ask for. But, I get this problem-solving poster, and because I'd studied with Jim, I take it, uh, we, we had formed a young men's leadership group. And this group was designed to get out of pathologizing young men in high school and get out of labeling and stigmatizing young men and create a leadership structure where young men could support one another and work together. So I brought this problem-solving poster into the group. And we practiced with it, and we dialogued with it, and we raised money. Uh, we, we, the young men, mostly them, the, these young high school students at Hill House High School, talking to each other and planning dances and basketball games and school, uh, just, you know, community cleanups and whatnot. And uh, so we end up about 15, 20 guys stay after school, which is not easy unless you have pizza, in which case it's very easy. 
So one day uh, I come to school and the uh, principal says to me, um, is Lamont Young one of your students in your leadership group? I said, yeah, he's in there, he's doing really well. And he said, well, I got some bad news for you. He said Lamont was uh, shot last night uh, seven times, point blank. I said, it's not, you got somebody, it couldn't be him. And he says, Tim, it's him. Uh, I, and I had, uh, I couldn't accept uh, that this had happened. It just didn't make any sense to me. I, we had formed this very strong bond with these young men, and uh, we were kind of in it together. So I, he, he, he had not died, miraculously, despite this. So I went down after school to Yale New Haven Hospital, just around this corner here, and there was a policeman outside the room, and I went into the room, and he was wrapped up in beeping sounds and no mo movement. Uh, I assumed he was barely conscious or in a coma, and I just held his hand. I said, you know, Lamont, all the, all the guys in the leadership group were just sending you our love, our affection, our concern. No movement. I stayed about five minutes. What else are you going to do? And as I turned to walk out, I saw his mouth start to move. And uh, I leaned over, and he whispers to me, Shrives. That's what he, Ev Ennis is here too, who's in this group. Uh, Next time, I'll use problem solving. And I thought to myself, you know, in this book, Jim, you've got a lot of young stories of young men who wanted a chance, deserved a chance, just didn't have the supports. And I was looking at Lamont there, basically uh, on his deathbed, uh, and feeling to myself that I had been a failure, because I feel like I was, honestly, um, that the system had been a failure, that it was outrageous, um, that we could have done better if we provided the developmental supports and the skills and the, and the teachers had understood these issues. Now this particular story has an amazing ending, especially tonight, because Lamont survives. And Lamont, uh, in May of this year, graduated with his master's in counseling psychology, and he is sitting right here. Stand up, young man. Come on, stand up. <laughs> Trying to get him a job, Jim. Can you? No, just get. <laughs> so there we are. This is me and Lamont. You, you see the real thing, so we don't have to spend time on the picture. But that we took that last year when we were uh, hanging out over in the coffee shop. I can't get this thing to work. I'm going to skip all this because it's too. B so here's 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 the second point I want to make. That's one. I'm, don't worry, not too many. Uh, the science is catching up to you, Jim. This slide is from the neuroscientist Patricia Kuehl at the University of Washington studying the social connection in the brain to learning. Uh, the neuroscience is telling us without question uh, that no social connection, the brain itself will not function. There is no attention without connection. So if you're not, if I haven't made a connection with you tonight, you're not paying attention. Not only are you not paying attention, you can't pay attention. Physiologically, unless, now maybe I'm guilting you into paying attention, so maybe you're starting to. <laughs> but otherwise, the brain won't connect. So the neuroscience is catching up, Jim. Uh, the health science is catching up. Uh, the Robert Wood Johnson's longitudinal study uh, suggests that the most important predictor of physical health is social and emotional, relational strength, right? Uh, the employment science is catching up. The employment markets are now, you go to the people at Google, we had uh, Linda and I working with the guy who was the head of HR at Google, he said the most important skills at Google are team building, problem solving, uh, and uh, creativity. Forget coding, easy to teach coding. We need people who are socially and emotionally connected, relationally competent, feeling a sense of purpose and worth. So this is, this is what the workplace is telling us. Uh, this is uh, even at a American Enterprise Institute. I don't know how many real good conservatives there are here, but even the conservatives are listening to James P. Comer, and they're saying, you want to end income inequality? We've got to teach the whole child. This was a report that came out a few years ago. 
Brookings and the American Enterprise Institute together. Politics should be no barrier to child development thinking in education. And when you look at the language, and this is, I guess, for me at least it's important, uh, sometimes you'll hear language that sounds a little more conservative. We want to do character. We want to do uh, job readiness. Sometimes you'll hear language that sounds a little more progressive, emotional intelligence, uh, child development. It doesn't matter, in my view at least. You can be lean red or you can lean white. The country is catching up to Jim Comer. Now, uh, this thing is really slowing me down, sorry. Benefit and that's too boring. Okay, here's the last one. <laughs> so, how many of you know the Grant study, the largest longitudinal study in, in the history of social science? So it's taken them uh, 75 years of studying one cohort uh, unfortunately, it was started in the 30s, so it's one cohort of men, uh, and in the last 30 years, their wives and children, grandchildren, and so on, but mostly, unfortunately, it started with just men. But after 75 years of study, the conclusion of the study uh, it has one point. Uh, the only thing that's going to make us happier is our relationships, the quality of our relationships. And so, if you think about social science, business, neuroscience, educational practices, politics, we are at a moment. We are at a moment. And why doesn't, for instance, I mean, I'm just going to get on my soapbox here, why doesn't this university, why doesn't this university, which has a business school and computer technology and the greatest child study center in the world and clinical psychology, why doesn't this university have a master's or a PhD? Linda Darling would come back to run the PhD program, maybe, if we, really, if we made it really enticing. Do we? Yeah. We'd have her come back to New Haven uh, to marshal the science of this moment and create a, a, a pioneering training center for educators interested in becoming, as you challenged them to be 30 or 40 years ago, experts in child development. Why don't we do it right here? The mayor would support it, right, mayor? We don't need any money from the city, don't worry. <laughs> Okay, we're going to skip this, too. I know I can't get through this stuff. So I'm really supposed to speak about the National Commission. That's really, the, so far, it's been mostly not about that, but I'm going to get to that. Um, the National Commission, two years in the making. Uh, I would suggest and submit to you that when the National Commission's report comes out, we have 100 scientists, practitioners, funders, parents, young people, uh, 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 scholars, the whole group. Uh, Dr. Comer is the honorary chair of the National Commission. After two years of work, it will probably have, if you summarize it, one conclusion. Guess what the conclusion will be after two and a half years of work? To place child development at the center of the educational enterprise. That's it. That's it. That's it. By the way, Marion, well, I won't go into that either. Uh, if, if I had to say, what I learned sitting at Jim Comer's feet, and it was almost literally at his feet, I didn't learn how to teach. I did learn how to listen. I did learn how to learn. Uh, I came in wanting to make a difference. I think Jim said, you gotta, we got to make us different. Um, I think uh, I learned... Uh, that as he writes in Beyond Black and White, that valuelessness and rejection are the greatest cancers in our society. Yep. Uh, I learned that I think I wanted at the time to make a difference for kids, uh, to help them move along, and he said the most important thing you can do is meet them where they are. Uh, these are the lessons the country, I believe, is now learning. Uh, we have the hope, not because it's a report, nobody cares about a report, but because of this coalition being strong. And if you look at the way they framed it, this, you could put Jim Comer's name on it. Here are the influencers in the life of the child. Jackie Jodel's the executive. Here are the influencers. People are taking seriously the complex structures that inform the development of children. We're not trying to do a widget intervention for second graders. Or come in and we'll just fix your sixth grade math program with a little extra STEM or something like that. Come on. 
Come on. Come on, it's ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. So here's how the National Commission is framing the challenge. Here are the stakeholders that need to play in a new structure, a new set of systems designed to make a difference in the life of children. That's boring too. Let's keep going. Now, uh, how much, do I have any more time or should I stop? Jim? Keep going. Okay. I have a few more. These are fun stories. <clears throat> now, uh, remember I said po political right and left uh, and child development, developmental thinking? Most people will hear Black Lives Matter and they'll hear po polit political, antagonistic, angry, fierce, determined, good words, maybe not so good words depending on the audience, right? Some audiences, yes, some audiences, no. But watch this little video just to see how uh, far Dr. Comer's uh, influence has reached. Can, I don't know if I can play this. Uh, can, can, you, can whoever's, I don't know where the technology even is. Oh, no, 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 go back. <laughs> this is short, this is short, this is short. <laughs> So the reason I think that's so important is the way the, the way the framing of the issue lands is with a question, with an attempt to elicit an experience. I imagine, fill in your blank, right? In this worldview, what's your contribution? So you could do this with second graders. You can do it, we could do, the, we could do this exercise in this room tonight. If we, if we had time, and I was given more time. No, but I'm not just kidding. Now, you got the glimpse of the next slide, but just brace yourself. Because in some ways, this is not funny. This is serious. But I believe that part of Jim's extraordinary output is that the work he's done is also gaining traction in people who we don't typically think of as being allied with it. Now, we don't have to be naive. I'm not suggesting naivete, but here is the First Lady of the United States who's challenging us to work and support children, including encouraging positive social, emotional, and physical habits and development for all children. Now, I'm not saying this is real policy, and if you don't want to look at it, I understand. I see some people looking away like they just can't stand it. It's okay, but if we want to heal the country, we have to look for ways to find common language. If we just want revenge, then, then we don't have to do this. Because revenge may be deserved. I'm not, gonna, I'm not in politics, I'm in education. If we want to educate children to overcome what, this, what the current environment says, we have to look for allies and ways to create a common language for all children. That would be my premise, and I think, Jim, that's what you've taught. Boom. Boom, boom, there we go. Now, my final point. Uh, Jim, uh, the most powerful advocates for your work today are under 25. Uh, we have a generation, uh, these are the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas young people uh, that command it. Now, doesn't matter where you stand on guns, uh, how about those young people? How about the public educators? How about the teachers? How about the fact that despite the horrifying tragedy that they were subjected to, they had the strength, the character, the determination, the strong substantive information, the willingness to stand up in front of adults 20, 30, 40 times their eight, years older than them and hundreds of times more powerful than them and hold their ground. Those were all educated by public school teachers. They were all educated in a public school environment and there are millions more like them. And they don't want to tolerate any longer the lie. Because it is a lie. And you ask that question, why has it taken so long? Why aren't people moving? These young people, 
I'm just going to share with you two or three other quick stories because I think they're all over the country. Here's the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas kids. Here's Luis Rodriguez. This is a kid we met in Cleveland uh, last year, uh, Cleveland High School. He's read 52 scholarly articles on police brutality. Uh, this ha I happened to uh, sit down with him during a little dialogue, and this was the cover of his senior project. He's in a school that's called Facing History in Ourselves, which is deeply rooted in a whole development pro framework. Kids don't study history to get facts and figures. They study history to become immersed in it, to learn from it, to become agents of history. See what he writes. He's got the names on the top of this of his peers who've been killed by the police and police officers who've died in the line of duty. There are so many people killing our, our people and there are so many people killing our cops. Why can't we be equal? Now here's a young man who has already understood something that, Jim, you probably would have to hope maybe PhDs would, which is the opposite of equality is violence, in his eyes, right? Not the opposite of equality is inequality, it's violence. On the back of this same page, which I don't have up on the slide, we're having a war within our people. Why is there so much hate and racism? Why don't we understand one life? They say we're all free, but yet we are all scared. What's the opposite of freedom? Fear. Terrified people uh, who cannot be free because they are afraid. Just like that little boy who kicked the teacher. I, by the way, you applauded him for that. I'm going to try that on you sometime. Uh, <laughs> But this is a young man, more seriously, this is a young man who has felt the impact of your work. Uh, the superintendent, as you remember, Jim, in that school was trained by you, I think in PG County. I think there's some PG County people here. Yeah. Uh, so even, uh, I think, the greatest testament to a life, Brian, you can be so proud of your dad, is that when his work, his voice has gone places he doesn't even know has extended beyond even the places that hold his name or his credential or his uh, brand. Here in Cleveland, this young man, who may not know the name Dr. James P. Comer, but he knows what you set out to teach him already. Here's one more. I, just want, I think I have one or two more. L look at this one. This is also the same thing. This is a school in Chicago. Um, Maybe, Brian, can I ask you to read that out loud? I'm putting you on the spot, just because I've been talking too much. Yes, that, the big, oh, oh, how about young Brian? Is that young Brian? Okay, young Brian, do you mind with big t uh, teacher voice reading this out loud? The whole thing starts with just because. Can you see it? Just because I'm... I am not lonely, I am not a loser, I am not awkward, I am intelligent, just because I am 10, I am not dumb, I am not stupid, 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 I am not you hear her voice challenging the culture? Do you hear her voice challenging the adults in her school? Do you hear her voice challenging gender stereotypes? At 10, she learned poetry. She learned sentence structure. She learned how to do well in school. And she learned that she's a powerful young woman at 10. Because she's had an experience that was a, is a Comer experience. Someone, somewhere along the line in that school that we've been working with around social and emotional learnings, somewhere, someone said to her, I want to hear from you. I value your voice. I want you to see yourself as a poet, not just to read other people's poetry and to get graded on it. So this is a 10-year-old. This is better cultural and social criticism than we see in Washington, D.C. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. That's not a joke. 
Okay, I know, I'm almost done. I know everybody wants to go home, it's a school night, come on. <laughs> if this thing weren't slow, I'd be faster. So I'm gonna leave you with one more last example from my work in Special Olympics. So we, we uh, because of the way Jim trained me, I took to my work in Special Olympics the idea that we could teach inclusivity. That we could actually teach and shape children uh, and their capacity to be inclusive rather than fearful and exclusive. And so we have an intervention. It's a Comer-type intervention. We call it Unified Champion Schools. Here's one school in Rhode Island. I just visited there uh, a couple of uh, months ago. They've rewritten their school pledge. Okay, so now they don't use the, our school is determined to optimize the learning of every child and make sure that everybody is optimized in learning and, you know, that <laughs> mission statement that you, we all have in our schools. They rewrote it. The kids did. Okay, how about Big Brian? Can you read it? It's called Ponagansett. Yeah. Yeah, this is, this is just one school. It's a suburban school. It's maybe not typical, but look what the young people are saying. Not that they are willing to accept, uh, not that they are stereotyping, uh, but when they see someone, they will go look for. It's an active agency of change, right? I'm going to go look for the lonely and the isolated, the left out, the challenged, the bullied. Most of us, that's a step too far. But these young people are ready to reinvent the way we think about education and the way they think about the country, in my view. Uh, I think this is, these are your young people too, Jim. Uh, and when I left you and, and went and taught, um, you know, I, I felt licensed to depart from the curriculum, and we spent uh, about a week or 10 days on the Amistad affair and ended up, thanks be to God, making a movie. Well, we didn't make the movie, but Steven Spielberg did, but it was because of what came out of New Haven and the great uh, recollections of the Amistad and the units that we taught, Althea and others taught at Hill House. Um, I spent two weeks on the Harlem Renaissance. Thank God there was no supervisor checking whether I covered World War I, because I didn't. <laughs> I remember actually teaching County Cullen. You won't, well, maybe you will remember this, Marlene. I taught County Cullen and Langston Hughes and Arta Bonton, Zora Neale Hurst, all these people. Um, and I remember once, uh, I don't know how many of you are fans of County Cullen. He's one of my favorite poets. Uh, this beautiful short poem he has called The Incident. I won't, I won't read it, but it's a description of a little boy uh, riding through the streets of Baltimore and makes eye contact and pops a big smile and gets called, uh, you know, an epithet. And the poem closes, I, I did print it out, so I'll just read the last stanza after he, 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 after this incident. And I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December of all the things that happened there, and that's all that I remember. Uh, he was writing about uh, trauma, He's writing about the pernicious effects of racism. He was writing about a country that didn't see him, couldn't see him, didn't understand him, wouldn't understand him. Um, but when I read, when we studied that poem, I, you know, you're in a room full of kids, high school kids, and you know, you see people get discouraged. I mean, why wouldn't they? And I remember, do you remember this, Marlene? I said uh, she, she was very chatty in high school, uh, <laughs> but I saw her put her head down and. Uh, I said, what, what's, what do you think? And, and I thought she'd say, you know, I just, wish, I just wish we could all be the same color and we wouldn't have this anymore. And she said, uh, I just wish we could all be a different color so there would be no two people the same. Uh, there is a whole country uh, of people that want a different I want us all to be a different color. They don't see diversity as a loss of identity. See, it's the giving of identity to everybody. Um, there's a whole country looking for an alternate message to the caustic, hateful rhetoric of our political parties. I like to think there's a purple party out there, uh, people who care about things like children, uh, that don't want to 
just figure out uh, who we can elect, but how we can reconnect, or maybe connect in some cases for the first time? What if there were a political movement that were uh, a Comer-like movement? What if it, uh, if it brought people to connect, to be about relationships, to be about supporting families? I'm not going to show that video either. I just want to close with one more slide. Um, I know I asked you once what your favorite book was, and you said it was Maggie's American Dream, the book about uh, Dr. Comer's mother, uh, uh, Maggie Comer. Um, uh, it's a great book, too. Uh, and um, I think it's time. Uh, healthy relationships create justice. Healthy relationships create structures that inform good practices. Healthy relationships love connection, safety, all those things you write about in this book. At the end of this book, you say we need a national ego. I don't know if you remember this, but I'm sure you do, maybe. A national ego. We need a different way of governing, making decisions. You talk about a, a commission structure, which I found gratifying, uh, where experts and diverse constituents could help shape policy through a much more collaborative, much more open-ended process. Uh, the recommendations in this book about how to change the country are recommendations for today. Uh, the only thing that's different from the time I believe this book was written is that your mom, uh, your family, Don and Brian, uh, and you, and Betty, uh, um, have given to the country over that 50 years the priceless gift of the insight, the simple insight, uh, that we are only as good as our relationships, uh, that everything else uh, comes from that. And I think uh, it would be uh, a tribute, uh, a fitting tribute to your mom, who in the end of the day I think is in some ways the hero of this story, for all of us to leave this room just as fiercely determined to make a difference for kids as she was to make a difference for you. Thank you all very much. <laughs>